What I had hoped would happen is that we'll all go through and make a brief statement, um, each one of us, student and faculty alike, and then we can throw it open for you to comment on what we've said. Um, and after that's over, we have um, something special. So I will let you greet Barbara, who will have the first one. Our goal, our goal is by next year, we have a different microphone. Would you please just align with me on that goal? Can everybody tolerate that if we change this? Uh, one of the things we were asked to do was to reflect on our own personal experience during the semester and also our experience as instructional faculty. And I think I want to start with my experience with my own section. And I was the one who only had one, so I only had a, an amazing group of 19, each one of whom had their own contribution. I think we all made a concerted effort to use amazing at least four times since that's what we've seemed to be reading in all of your essays lately. And we probably should say day one next semester, never use that word. <laughs> but <clears throat> a very unique group. I think when we went around the room last week, we found out something about 12 or 14 different majors out of 19 people. We came together as a group, some buffs, some starts and stops. But what I saw was an enormous deepening of understanding and a web of connection between the students. And that for me was what was important, not just that they were doing the things I told them to, jump higher, write better, think, think harder, but they were actually challenging each other. And you could see as we went through the semester, with each speaker they would put on another layer of understanding. For instructional faculty, it is enormously rewarding. It's the kind of thing that keeps us going at 2 in the morning when we're grading all those things that you've been writing till 4 in the morning. Mm -hmm. In terms of my own experience this semester, it was the first time I got to talk on a topic that has been near and dear to my heart, but a new one for me, which was post-Holocaust literature. And I, I think I have a couple of shells. I think I'm up to four now, of work. And the hardest part was trying to make any sense of it. What was so heartening for me, and I am so appreciative of, is the way in which so many of you wrote about it and told us that the literature helped you, that it was a window in for you, in terms of understanding the personal experiences, not just, I was in this camp, and then I went to that camp. I was on this train and it was hot, and there was no room, and there was no water. But to really have a sense from a variety of sources that dealt with not just the Holocaust, but gave us an opening to the experiences of people who've experienced other genocides, other attempted genocides. And for me, it's an area that I give you my commitment I will continue to work on. So stay tuned. I'll be back. Thank you. section. And we just wanted to start by thanking the teachers and professors and lecturers that made this what it was and their passion for this topic and their willingness to uh, share their experiences with us. For me personally, I had a real tough time connecting with this material in the beginning. The beginning of the series was a lot about the Holocaust and I'm not Jewish. I don't have any Jewish relatives. I don't know anyone from Germany at that time. And I saw this passion, this fire in our teachers and in our lecturers that I really didn't have for the topic, and I felt, I felt really guilty that I wasn't as passionate about it and as into it as, as these people were, because you know, six million people died, and why wasn't, why wasn't I into it as much as they were? Then we got to the material about Rwanda and the more current issues, and once I started reading about Rwanda and heard the lecture, I finally realized that genocide isn't just somebody else's problem. It's not just past generations. It's not just in Germany 
back in the 40s, but it's really our generation's problem as well. And I got the feeling that how dare these people kill while I was alive. It almost felt like it was personal because it's, you did this on my watch, on our time. And it's, you know, what can, I can't blame the Holocaust, that's past, but Rwanda and these things are happening now. And that's really the point where I realized that it's personal for me and that's where I found my connection and that it's relevant to us. It's not history. This isn't a history class, but this is happening today. And we have to try to do something about it. And so in our final discussion, we kind of discussed what can we do? I mean, I'm one person. I'm one student. How am I going to stop six million people from dying? How am I going to stop the Tutsis from being killed in Rwanda? How am I going to stop the Hutus from doing it again? And it seemed all fuel to start. Why, why should I start this huge undertaking when I can't do anything about it effectively? I can't stop hundreds of thousands of people from dying. But then someone made the very real comment that one drop of water raises the level of the ocean. And albeit a very little portion I'm going to add to this crisis, it's going to be something. And somebody else mentioned the ripple effect of water, where if I tell five people and they tell five people, well, if each one of us tells five people and each one of those people tells five people, just think about the massive effect, the ripple effect that it's going to have. And that's how we can affect change. I can't do it all my own. I can't go fight these people. I can't stop this genocide all by myself. But if we come together from this class, from this lecture series, and tell the people and bring it out there, it's going to make some effect. Undoubtedly, more people are going to learn. And the more people who know about it, the more people are fighting for this cause. And in coming and trying to come full circle in this class and make sense of what we learned, it, it seems effective to go back to the original question which we started this series with, with, which was, what does never again mean? And it seems we we read in our lectures in our discussion that it's futile to think that never again will genocide happen. I mean, it's not real. It's not going to happen. Genocide's going to happen again. That's the reality of it. And if we think that it's not, we're kidding ourselves. So it comes down to what does never again mean for us, and what's our personal interpretation of it. And as free citizens, as citizens who can vote, as citizens who can freely assemble, as citizens who can freely speak, what does it mean? And our, in our section, we condensed it down to this. After the eye-opening lectures and discussions, we came to the conclusion that never again we would be ignorant, quiet, uninformed, bigoted, or hateful. And never again we will we remain quiet about something that is important to us. Finally, and most importantly, we will never stand by and watch innocent people be killed without doing all that is in our power to stop it. Thank you. genocide that I thought I did know prior to taking this class. I found that there were many misconceptions I had about the Holocaust and genocide. This class has taught me and my section, and I'm sure as it did the rest of you, that genocide is a complicated concept to grasp for many reasons. Through the lectures, readings, and discussion within my section, we have discovered that genocide isn't just mass murder of a group. That genocide doesn't have to equal the Holocaust with its systematic implementation of a final solution. It doesn't just affect those that survive. That anyone can become a perpetrator in committing, suicide, in committing genocide. And most importantly, we have learned that genocide hasn't stopped since the Holocaust. We have learned the devastating reality that of the many times genocide has occurred since the Holocaust, political leaders have been afraid to even recognize them as genocide. The mere use of a word has such profound ramifications for, for political leaders. Calling the kettle black or the killings in Rwanda genocide, for example, means political leaders have to intervene. The Genocide Convention, which after much struggle finally gave a name to a crime without a name, 
obligates the world to intervene wherever acts of genocide have been found. A simple manipulation of semantics has, in many cases, we found, been the fine line to terminate intervention. We have learned that genocide does not have to reach pr the proportions the Holocaust did, and that this is an excuse or, or a barrier, however you choose to see it, that has prevented many political leaders, like the United States, from recognizing genocides as genocides. As Samantha Power wrote in her textbook, A Problem from Hell, America's public awareness of the Holocaust often seemed to set the bar for concern so high that we were able to tell ourselves that contemporary genocides were not measuring up. In line with that, we have also learned that politicians, though it doesn't always seem to be the case, are in fact swayed by our public opinion as our constituents. They are afraid to commit troops to stopping genocide, for example, because they are afraid about how we will react. But if we can inform ourselves about genocides that are happening through our own research or seeking out alternative news sources, then I think we can make our own conclusions and a difference in stopping genocides. Just imagine. What if we all use our voices to tell our political leaders that we do care about people that are not Americans? I think we have learned that this might make our leaders act in the name of humanity and not in the name of what is economically or politically sound. In the end, we all bear the responsibility. We have learned that it doesn't take much for someone to become a perpetrator in committing acts of genocide. I think one constant we have found in the genocides we have studied is the removal of the victim group from the universe of moral obligation the circle of persons to whom we are obligated to respect and treat with dignity as human beings. In all the instances of genocide, we have seen that the victim group is identified as different and is therefore seen as inferior or as the enemy. We have read about ordinary men that after some time and even some hesitation were eventually able to kill without thinking twice about their victims because they have been removed from their universe of moral obligation. I personally have been most affected by the individual stories of the survivors of the Holocaust and Rwanda genocide, as well as by the children of the survivors of the Holocaust. I'm sure you all would agree with me. When you are inundated with so many facts and so much information, I think we forget that there are individual stories involved, individual people. Lucille, William, Bernard, William, and Valentina all remind us that real people are affected by genocide and in different ways. Just as people vary in personality, size, shape, and color, so do the experiences of the survivors of genocide. We have also learned that genocide affects the generations to come, as we saw with the stories of Dean Leader, Blair, and Julia last week. Even we, the class, has been affected by genocide, whether, we, whether or not we personally know someone who is a survivor. So I've given you an idea of what my section and I have learned over the semester. So what do we do now? I know that for myself, I'm going to make sure that I can educate anyone that I can on genocide. I especially want to make sure that the younger generations know what the indicators of genocide are, since we should know them since we wrote a paper on them. We should know at least five. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed clear to all of us in our section that every little bit we did could make a difference. Whether it was writing a letter to a congressperson or writing a letter to a Rwanda child, we now have the knowledge and the, pa and the power lies in our hands. I, for example, now have the knowledge and power to make sure that when my nieces and nephews are ready, I can educate them about the genocide and all its complexities. We all now, we all now can do our part, however small or trivial it may be, to ensure that never again really means never again. We want to thank you all very, very much for going through this difficult semester at a very difficult time in history when we are aware of what else is going on in the world. And I was thinking I would make some suggestions that can lift your spirits, which I think is what we all need. It helps enormously to join up with other people who would like to do something to change situations where people are suffering in the world and you can start from your smallest immediate environment to contributing or working in places all over the world. 
For instance, I just wrote down a few ideas that I know have been very successful. For instance, it doesn't cost anything and it can give great satisfaction and help another young human being to become a big brother or a big sister. I myself did that many years ago when I was in Berkeley and the young boy that I spent about five years with regularly was uh, one of the musicians who contributed music to the film Boys in the Hoods. In the Hood, you can see his name, Daryl Savage, at the end of the credits. And you can choose what might be your interest. Really go with your heart, what you would like uh, to do, where you would like to put some energy, and do only that that you really believe in helping animals, working on genetically engineered food, stopping nuclear weapons, whatever might be interesting to you, working with Habitat for Humanity right here in California or going to Central America, the organization that Jimmy Carter and his wife Rosalie started, where you build houses for people. There are many, many different possibilities for you as a volunteer to donate money to, or also to use as a choice for your profession. You can think about working for a non-profit organization as a full-time employee. That is a possibility that I wish I had thought about when I was choosing what to do uh, with my life's work. But what is also important, especially in these times that are so heart-wrenching for us, is to celebrate life. We all have a right to live this life. Everybody does. The ones who can't do it right now, who are being involved, bombarded, killed, injured, we almost have to live life, I think, for them at this moment. So enjoy your time with your friends, your family, go dance, play music, paint, take pictures, do what you really like to do, because almost we have to keep it up for those who can't do it right now and dance. And I thought I would read you a few uh, sentences from one of our students who wrote a paper about what had we learned, not knowing really, I think, that this was going to be our final discussion in our lecture series. It was terribly depressing, nonetheless, learning about, nonetheless, learning about the past isn't supposed to be all peaches and cream. To learn only of the triumphs of the human spirit and not its sinister capacity would be to not learn at all. It would be to deny half of the story, and thus it would be to deny the story itself. So what have we learned? It seems that men and women will act in their self-interest and that anyone, even the most ordinary of people, can be relegated to the most despicable circumstances. But if that is true, then how do we account for those men and women rescuers risking their lives like Knut Dalby, European citizens attempting to alert the allies of the death camps, reporters and journalists such as Samantha Power screaming about Miranda to Washington, and the incredible heroism of the students of the White Rose, the German young student resistors who were mostly all killed. That's just it. You have the free will to choose. Some choices may result in the ultimate sacrifice, but the choice is yours. Nobody said this life was easy. It is not easy to discuss topics that are distasteful and provoke depression. It is not easy or very desirable to put others before yourself or to put your life on the line. It is, not easy to, it is so easy to encircle yourself in your little day-to-day -day worries and ever concern yourself with anyone but yourself. I didn't want to feel depressed when I was deciding to take this course. I wanted to feel good as much as possible. But to feel good, you have to be aware of what it is to feel bad. Sometimes the best rewards in life are not ones that will benefit you, but will benefit the cause, the collective whole, society in general. Your sacrifices for the betterment of human, humankind will long outlast anything you do for yourself. For one day you will die, that crimes or kindnesses against humankind and the human spirit will live on for generations. Thank you.
Katie in um, focus section number five. Um, when she asked me to kind of talk about what I've learned, there's so much information that we've taken in. I mean, we've talked about historical facts and emotional facts, and we just talked about so many things that I think you could stand up here and talk for two hours about what we've taken from this class. But, I mean, we've, I think I'm going to throw up. I'm just kidding. <laughs> A little nervous. Um, <laughs> we've seen what genocide looks like, we've read about genocide, we've, we've heard talks about genocide, but I don't think any of us will ever, ever, hopefully, I hope to God, never know what genocide feels like, like on a personal basis. Um, I mean, we've read books about genocide, about America's actions within genocide, or lack of actions within genocide. Um, and I mean, I feel like this class has just been a big gift because, I mean, we've been, we're one of the last generations that's going to listen to Holocaust survivors speak, and that's, I mean, that's amazing. Um, so I decided to take three main points that really stuck out to me, and that I feel like, I mean, I'm going to take away a lot, but I feel like these are the three things that will really come with me as I leave this class. Um, and I think they're best described by the people that taught them to us. So um, Matilda said, in her lecture when she was talking about Rwanda. She said, we can't understand our commonalities without understanding our differences. And I think this is just so true because we're, with a lack of education and a lack of understanding with other people's religions and beliefs and culture, we're just, I mean, we're acting in stupidity. We don't know enough about them to hate them or to kill them, for God's sakes. But, I mean, I think it's so true what she said that, you know, we're all really common in the end, and we're all human beings at the root of everything. So, I mean, it's, I think if we just understand each other's differences and accept each other's differences, we'll really be pleased that we're all relatively similar and can really get along. Um, Lillian said, when she was in the survivor panel, um, she said, I will never forget, but I will not carry angry bitterness and hatred because it hurts me more than those who did it to me. And that struck me as amazing because, um, because I feel like if I could give somebody the right to hate, like, hey, you can hate somebody, it would be these survivors. I mean, they have been through, I mean, more than I will ever comprehend. And I feel like they have the right to hate and they're the people that don't hate. And hate breeds hate. And they know that. And I mean, I just, I was in awe of the survivors and how much strength and compassion and, I mean, I just had so much respect for them, listening to them. I just, it, it made me realize how little my life is compared to what they did. And if they're not going to hate, then we don't have the right to either. Um, the third one is um, New Daidi. Hope that's how you say it. Um, and he was the rescuer from Denmark said, um, when help is needed, you have to be an activist instead of a bystander. In the Holocaust, there were way too many bystanders. What hurt the Jewish, what hurt the Jewish people was not the aggression of the enemy, but the silence of the bystander. And kind of to tie it all together, I feel like, you know, we're, we're sitting in silence without being educated about other people. And, I mean, traveling and taking classes like this and taking the time to learn about other people is going to give you knowledge about how to respect and understand other people's cultures. And, I mean, I'm not an active activist person. I don't, I should do more, we should all do more, but this is my first step in being an activist. I mean, we can't sit in silence anymore because I feel like our young population is just we don't know what's going on. We, we have crap news, we have crap newspapers, and we don't even read those. So, I mean, what we have, we don't use, even though they're not very good, but, I mean, I feel like we're all just kind of sitting and letting, I mean, if you support the war, go support the war. If you don't support the war, then don't support the war, but do something. I mean, this is our country, this is our future, and we are sitting in silence. And I feel like if we take anything from this class, we need to take that we can't sit in silence anymore, and being educated about other people is where we're going to become activists. So, 
um, with that, I want to say thanks to the teachers because I feel like they've all been activists. And you said that you wanted to be a part of a, you should have thought about being a, in a non-profit organization before, but I feel like you, you're doing the same thing here. You know, you're, you're being an activist. I mean, you're a non-profit too, but... Um, <laughs> doing something good here too. I mean, you just educated people, this whole room full of people, and that's amazing in itself. So, thank you. My grandmother, she was uh, born and raised in Czechoslovakia. Um, she was at a younger age during the Holocaust period, so she, um, she, was, she was younger. So during the, at the beginning of the war, she was, um, she was hidden by a few nuns who had, uh, behind their house, they had a large field where there were several haystacks. And for the beginning part of the war, for several months, my grandmother, she, she hid inside these haystacks, and the nuns brought her food and whatever they could bring her to survive. And uh, until that got, you know, it, was, it became unsafe for the nuns to be hiding my grandmother. She was later taken and uh, hidden by other non-Jews. So um, it's pretty obvious that having lost so many people in my family in the Holocaust, as well as having some survive, that a class like this is very important to me, as well as the saying of never again. Um, you know, when you, uh, you look throughout history, under every single type of economic system, we've seen how the leaders of these systems have used human beings as commodities and, and treated them as trash when there's, you know, there's conflict or when any sort of conflict arises and war becomes uh, eminent. You see how the, the humanness of humans is lost and how the respect for life is basically thrown out the window. Um, a big part of Never Again, to me at least, is the idea of the universal obligation that we all should have, which is that we should never allow any social or political movement to devalue the loss of lives and to never again allow the mistreatment of any group. Jews for centuries, they've been victims of discrimination, prejudice, uh, you know, dating back to, to the Crusades and then, and then on to the, the Russian pogroms and followed by the Nazi pogroms and even uh, up until present day issues of, that are occurring between the Arab and well, the, the Arab and Jewish relations, you know, they're they're going in the wrong direction, basically. So um, I think what we as a class taking this class should realize is through our studies of the different genocides um, is that these the people who are the victims of these genocides, the people who are persecuted, they all vary in different ethnicities, different religions, different races, and it's very possible that someday it could be you, the perpetrators, are coming for. So that's why, to me, the saying of never again is very important. Thank you. Last and least, uh, I really can't say much more than what everyone just said. Um, this is my second semester studying the Holocaust and probably about my 16th year actually learning about the Holocaust. I am Jewish. It's something I've studied for a long time. If anything else, it is very important that we realize we are capable of committing genocide just like that. Not people outside, but we in here. We are just as important as anyone else. We have the right to make decisions. And in America especially, we can voice those decisions, and we can have a class like this, and we can talk about things that are devastating and horrible, but we can talk about them. In other places, they can't talk about things like that because it's, it's against their government, because they're talking down on the government. 
Well, Samantha Power pretty much plain talks about our government, and she says it's a bad thing that we do all these things. And we have committed horrible atrocities by not saying anything about genocides that have occurred across the world. Never again to me means never again will Germans kill Jews in 1940 year. I know it's from power. I know you've heard it before, but I will continue to say it. The more educated we are as ordinary people, the more we can change things. It is up to us as the buffer to change things. If we just accept them for what they are, then governments and tyrants will continue to, to destroy things that we hold so dearly. It is up to each one of us to change things. Like, like Kevin said, each one of us is a seed of knowledge. And if we implant our seed of knowledge into five other people, then they implant their seed of knowledge into five other people. And all of a sudden, we have a huge tree and we can take down anything. So please, take this class very seriously and please remember what all these people said. It's very important. Thank you. say it again because sometimes uh, you don't get it unless you hear it several times. Um, I always learn the most from you. Um, each time I do this I am grateful for the opportunity to be able to share what I know with you. But I always, always learn so much more, I feel, from you. Um, the thing that I want to repeat is that I admire and commend your courage because as I've said, anybody who signs up for a class that mentions it's going to be about the Holocaust and genocide has to be a very brave student. Um, I'd like to read something to you from about why what we do is so important. And it's from Ellie Wiesel. And it's um, aimed at people who teach. But now I see that because you know you will do as Kevin said, you will teach others what you've learned. I know it. I can tell already. You've already spoken to your family members and your friends and your roommates who think you're crazy. Elie Wiesel said, how do you teach events that defy knowledge, experiences that go beyond imagination? How do you tell children, big and small, that society could lose its mind and start murdering its own soul and its own future? How do you unveil horrors without offering at the same time some measure of hope? Hope in what? In whom? In progress, in science, in literature, in God. You have taken up that challenge this semester, and I know that a great deal about what you've learned is still unresolved. But as I say, I commend you all for your efforts at it. Uh, to those of you who are graduating, um, our best wishes go with you. We hope that you will take what you've learned here out into the world and that some of you will return to us and let us know how the world has received you. And so, thank you very much. There's someone else I want to acknowledge. Um, one of the, as I've told you, one of the things that makes this work is the Alliance for the Study of the Holocaust and Genocide at Sonoma State University. Uh, they help us in all different ways. And this year, not only did uh, Professor McCaffrey, Lesh McCaffrey, uh, become our new uh, chairperson, but we also had a student, uh, a former student of the Holocaust Lecture Series, who gave of her time and energy and spirit. And I'd like to acknowledge 
Perla for her contribution. Okay, one last thing. Um, unbeknownst to you, at the edges of the semester, but uh, not at the end of the semester, and all through the semester, we have been secretly asking you for copies of your response papers. <clears throat> and the reason we've done that is because one of the founding members of the Alliance for the Study of the Holocaust, Sylvia Sucre, um, was an English teacher. And we wanted to think of some way to honor her and to honor her contributions to what we do. So we came up with the Sylvia Sucre uh, Holocaust Essay Award. And uh, she's not as well as she could be. Uh, we hope that she will be back with us. But over a very pleasant lunch at her home, the faculty sat and poured through your essays. And we would like to um, award the Sylvia Sucre Holocaust Lecture Series Essay Award this year to Audra Link, who is here. Audra, come on. and words and pictures. Thanks very much. The, the title of your paper was something? Watch Your Children. Watch Your Children. Um, and it was written fairly early in the semester. Okay, what we want to do now is open it up to you. I know um, many of you still have um, ideas that you'd like to express. Anybody want to respond to anything? Any reflections of your own of what you're going to take with you? Matt? My name is Matt McCaffrey. I, I want to thank you very much for all of the speakers, all of the different panels and topics, and particularly for the, the wonderful speaker from Denmark. Um, uh, as you said, the, the, the topic of Holocaust is not one where you say, oh gosh, let's go for a number of laps to the Holocaust lecture series. Um, but the heaviness of the topic was balanced by that wonderful man describing how people spontaneously acted. And when I asked a question of him, well, what was the difference between yourselves and perhaps the people of Poland, it was that, well, before the war, um, the, the people who were Jewish were Danes who happened to be Jewish. That there was a, an educational environment, a, a societal environment, in which people were considered equals. And um, uh, I think your panelists today address that in talking about how can we ensure it's never again, and it's by us trying to confront our own prejudices and to see whether we can indeed emulate the example of that wonderful speaker. So thank you again. Thanks. As you know, that subject is rather close to my heart. I wrote my dissertation about the uh, Denmark during the war, during the German occupation. Um, those of you who have taken classes from me are probably sick. Who said sick? Sick to death. <laughs> Danish words. I, I do have one um, last thing that I would like to say, and that is I would like to thank my colleagues, and Barbara, who have given me so much support uh, this is, this takes a lot of work and um, for various reasons. 
I needed a lot of support from them this year. So, Barbara? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Very much.